Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Rachel Voita, and we are talking today about the Restoration, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, all that good stuff. Uh, I can't remember quite where we left off last time, so we'll do a quick recap of Zerubbabel and Joshua, who were the first to come back from the exile, the first to lead the return a mass exodus, second exodus. Um, Zerubbabel being the political leader and descendant of Judah um, and Joshua being the high priest. Now, if you're paying attention, reader, <laughs> you will notice that there is a problem with uh, Joshua being the high priest, having never served in the temple or been cleansed or ordained to his office in the ways prescribed in the Old Testament, which is where Zechariah comes in handy. Um, I'm I'm just going to toss this to you, Greg, <laughs> at this point, <laughs> because it's a minor prophet, and I'm scared. A lot of people are, <laughs> are are scared of the minor prophets. They 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 come to you in your dreams with uh, sharp teeth and flaming red eyes, and <laughs> and we never know where to find them. They're somewhere toward the back of the Old Testament, we think, but we're not sure what order they. Unless you've memorized the song. Well, Zechariah is one of the last prophets to write in the Old Covenant era. He and Haggai are serving at the same time, and they're encouraging uh, Joshua and Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple. The only prophet who comes after them who writes as what we think of as a writing prophet is Malachi. He writes about the same time that um, Nehemiah is doing his stuff. So here we are, and yes, this is a real problem, because uh, the original tabernacle system was initiated from Mount Sinai, by God, telling Moses, do this stuff to Aaron, and he'll be a high priest, and build the tabernacle, and get it going this way, and then I'll come and, and I'll come and bless it. We don't have any of that. We have a, a political decree from a God-fearer, Emperor Cyrus, saying, go back and rebuild this temple thing and get it going. So here they are, and th this, is, this is, some have called this a catch-22. For Joshua to begin his work, he must be set aside, anointed, uh, uh, dedicated according to the law and the temple rites, and to do that, you would need a temple. You don't have a temple because you don't have a priest to initiate the rites. So <laughs> as soon as you get a, t a priest to initiate the rites, you can ordain a priest to initiate it. Yeah, <laughs> it goes in a circle here. <laughs> So in the midst of this, Zechariah has a vision. This is Zechariah chapter three, and God. Oh, by the way, can I just throw in some uh -huh. uh, interesting Mormon history? This oh. is a real problem for the Mormon Church, given that oh. the first two people of the Mormon Church had to baptize each other. Oh yes, which is unlawful <laughs> in the Mormon <laughs> Church <laughs> because then one of them was baptizing as an unbaptized person. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, some of our Baptist friends might consider their own heritage along the same lines. Mm -hmm. You know, the sprinkling stuff isn't real baptism. Okay, well, you baptize me, and then I'll... Hmm. <laughs> um, anyway. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing on his right hand to resist him. Uh, so there's Joshua getting ready to do his high priestly stuff, except Satan is there hurling accusations at him. And the Lord, this would be Jesus, said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And so we're, we're not seeing what Zechariah is seeing, so now he tells us. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel, angel of the Lord. That's Jesus. So here's the problem. The garments are defiled, and uh, that's that's a problem, I mean, because the garments here represent the, the moral and spiritual character of the man. How does a sinner just jump right into representing God to man and man to God? And this is what Satan is pointing out. Satan is not in a sense, lying, he is simply pointing out what seems to be obvious. This man is a filthy, polluted sinner. How in the world can you permit him to act as a mediator between God and men? But the angel of the Lord says, basically, 
He is he he does not say shut up. I almost said that. He says the Lord rebuke thee because he does not say shut up to Satan. He just lets he turns it over to his father and lets his father deal with him. Um, and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. So there are others there, perhaps other priests or, or angels, and they come and they take away the filthy garments. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. So the angel of the Lord takes it all upon himself. And being God, he can do that, and he can do it on the basis of what he will one day do, but it's all in him. It's not on anything in, in Joshua. So the clothes are changed, and Zechariah gets into this and says, Let them set a fair miter upon his head. That's the priestly turban that bears the plate, holiness to the Lord. So they set a fair miter upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And then there are promises that follow, and he points to Joshua as a type, an image of the branch, the Messiah who's to come. And so now Joshua is restored by the angel of the Lord directly, be even better than Moses. And he can go about and, and do the sacrificing and get the rituals going to restore the temple. So critical moment, the world will look at this and say, well, you got people, you got money, you got stuff, just get going with your religious stuff. No, it's not that easy. This is actually a very critical moment in redemptive history. How do you get around this? Well, you, God intervenes personally. There's no Mount Sinai. There's no thunderings and fire and Shekinah glory. Uh, there's a vision. Uh, dream, and it is enough. God speaks directly through his prophet and set, pushes the button, and things start going, and yet restoration worship will never be what it had been under Solomon. It's smaller temple, the Shekinah glory is absent as far as appearance is concerned, the Ark of the Covenant is gone, there's no divine fire on the altar, uh, but it is worship acceptable to God because God has declared it so. And so now the countdown begins. We're waiting for Messiah. Daniel has said 490 years till the coming of Messiah. We have Daniel's chart of the empires to come. Golden Babylon, Silver Medo-Persia, Brazen Greece, and then Iron Rome, and then the coming of the kingdom of the God of heaven. So after 4,000 years, we're down to under 400 years. We're getting close, and yet, and yet, and yet, we're not there yet. Meanwhile, the Persian Empire rules the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, 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 the situation is not so removed from our own where we, we expect greater and greater things for the kingdom of God uh, and yet we look around and the Persian kings were in many ways better than a lot of our presidents and, and parliaments and congresses uh, we've already seen Cyrus the Lord's anointed my shepherd the man who will do all my bidding he restores Jerusalem uh, and by the time we get uh, to Zerubbabel and Joshua, they're they're busy restoring, but during that time Cyrus dies. Cyrus is is campaigning and dies in battle, and the the throne passes briefly to Cambyses, his son, who doesn't like the Jews at all. And uh, there's somewhere in here the Jews' enemies send word saying these these evil people are trying not only to rebuild the temple, they don't, they don't mention that. They're, they're rebuilding the city, and this is a bad, the, the great phrase, it's a bad city. <laughs> the, the words failed them. They hadn't read Strunk and White or anything. Um, and uh, he had, uh, Cambyses had been working in Egypt, conquering Egypt, and while Cyrus was dead, another possibly son, possibly imposter, they were kind of not sure at the time, and historians have gone back and forth ever since. But anyway, a man named Bardia takes the throne, claims to be Cyrus's brother. Uh, but Cyrus's generals don't believe him or, or don't want to believe him or just want him out of the way, depending on who you believe. And the chief of these is a man named Darius, like, like but not the same as the Darius of Alliance. And this is a different Darius. He's a general. And he comes and takes control of the throne. And just during this time, the letter reaches him and accuses Jerusalem of all kinds of horrible things. He's really busy consolidating power. He hasn't got time to listen to this. It, it sounds like a plausible threat, but probably from Cyrus and others, he has learned a lesson 
um, about um, the laws of the Medes and the Persians. <laughs> he, he hadn't learned it quite well enough, we're going to see. But he does put a tagline on it. So it's, tell them to stop rebuilding until I say otherwise. And then he goes about <laughs> his business. Well, as we read in, in Haggai and Zechariah, what happened with the Jewish people at this point is they they went into a, a, a funk. They said, oh, well, this isn't going anywhere. Uh, we can't rebuild the temple. We can't do anything. No, he hadn't said don't rebuild the temple. He said don't rebuild the city. Hmm. And they had been emphasizing building their own nice homes more than building the city. In fact, they were taking some of the wood that Cyrus had dedicated for the temple and building their homes with it. And this is where Haggai comes in and says, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? God is already smiting you with poverty and, and pestilence in the land and such because uh, upon your fields, because you're supposed to be building the house of God and you're running everyone to build your own house. Stop it. Get your act together and do the right thing. <laughs> You have Hindsight's not been, 2020, but yeah. like it seems like this could have been a wake up call to be like, oh yeah, we won't rebuild the city. We'll do what we were supposed we're to, do. to do. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that once the prophet pointed out, they did, and that's one of the mm -hmm. great glories of the restoration. Is so many times, the, the people do their traditional fall into sin, but when they're rebuked, they say, oh rats, yeah, you're so right. We'll, we'll stop. We'll, we'll we'll go do what God said now. And they That's do. so weird. Yeah. <laughs> Why now? <laughs> the, the, the rest, because the Restoration Era, in many respects, is an era of greater glory and, and greater grace. Messiah is at hand, and the, the streams of light are getting brighter. There's more of Scripture. The Holy Spirit has more tools to work with, as it were, fuller pictures of Messiah drawn in the prophets. Beyond that, we, it is God's good pleasure. Uh, and um, so eventually... These these people push the issue again with Darius while they're rebuilding the temple. And at this time, Darius has time to listen. And he does. And what he says, in Ezra 5, we, we have the enemies of the Jews. These are the Gentiles who live round about, among them the Samaritans, coming and saying, well, who commanded you to build this house and make up the wall? Who's to give us some names here? Uh, but this time, the elders of the Jews didn't back down and force the matter back to Darius. The, the enemy sent another letter. And they say, Be it known unto the king that we went to the province of Judea, to the house of the great God, which is builded with great stones and timber is laid in the walls, and this work goeth on fast and prospereth in their hands. Then ask we those elders and said unto them, Who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We ask their names also to certify thee that we may write the names of the men that were chief among them. And they returned us answer, saying, We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And build a house that was built these many years ago, which a great king of Israel builded and set up. But after that our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave, the, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this house and carried the people away captive. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon in Persia, the same king Cyrus made a decree to build this house, and, and so it goes. And the letter ends with, would you please check on this? We don't believe these guys. Would you see if there actually was a decree? Because if there's a decree, a lot of the Medes and Persians, they already have all they need. So the enemies are hoping that they're lying, they're making it up or exaggerating or something. And Darius faced with, oh, you're asking about royal precedent, and I guess I have to listen to that one, don't I? He orders the search. And it's interesting how difficult it is for them to find the document. Uh, it appears twice in Scripture, so you would think. But that seems to be not the one that got filed. The one that got filed is a little different, a little more sp uh, specific as to how the house is to be rebuilt. But it does bear Cyrus' seal and signature. And so having read this, uh, Darius says, Let the work of this house of God alone. The governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. Moreover, I make a decree what you shall do to the elders of the Jews. They wanted to do something to the elders. I'm going to tell you what you can do to those elders. That of the king's good, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that it be not hindered. And you guys all, you're going to pay for this out of your own tribute that would have come to us, but we're redirecting it. So you're going to pay for the rebuilding process. Thank you very much. That they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and of his sons. Persian nationalism. <laughs> um, 
Oh, you don't you didn't see that. A friend of ours sent around uh, a Lutheran satire video. Oh, I saw it. <laughs> Did you see it? About yeah. which one was it? I don't know it, if I saw it. The it's latest. about American nationalism. Uh, Christian it's nationalism. Christian nationalism. It's viewed yeah. as a um as a game show. Mm-hmm. Oh. With all with a full force of the br- and brilliance of Lutheran um sarcasm and mm-hmm. irony. I'm not going to go a whole lot further with this, but mm. the rest it's a of great, you, it's great it, comedy it, sketch. Unless you're its target, it's fantastic. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. well, I was just thinking, as, as you were reading, I was going, wow, there would be so many people today that would uh, balk at the fact that the government is paying for the building of the temple. Yeah. And not just their government, it's a foreign pagan government. And in return, they're supposed to pray for those people. Um, yeah. So many people today would have said, no, no, government money can't ever come and help the church. Yeah. Um, it's Yeah. And most of those people, oddly enough, would be Christians. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. the point of view of this this little video. Three people on the game show come up with reasons why there should ever never be any connection between the, the church and the state, even to the point of the church barely existing as the church. Because, you know, that. Anyway, <laughs> you, you can look that up and find out about that. <laughs> Uh, but here, what what is interesting, of course, is that Ezra does not throw up his hands, or, or the, the Zubabul and Joshua don't go back and say, uh, "Wait, Your Majesty, while well, we certainly appreciate the sentiment, uh, you can't do that. Separation of church and state. We'll come up with money somehow. God will provide." Yeah, they 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 don't do that. They 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 take every cent they get. Um, but um. Darius goes further. So we want, I, I want, they need to be praying for the king and, and his sons. And I've made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be pulled down from his house and being set up, let him be hanged thereon and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree. Let it be done with speed. A couple things there. First of all, he does not include until I say otherwise. He's mm. firmly committed. Two, he acknowledges God not simply as a hypothetical concept or as one of many possibilities within his polytheistic empire. Uh, this is a God whom he expects to act in history, a God from whom he expects divine favor. And third, he does not talk about so that God will bless Persia. <laughs> he, he he turns the other way. And let God destroy all of his enemies mm-hmm. uh, in history, in time. And again, so many people today would say, oh, he had such an infantile understanding of the God of Israel. No, he didn't. <laughs> exactly the way God works in history. Well, and there's something almost uh, prophetic about what he says here, thinking of someone that's going to come most likely in his uh, reign, Haman. Yes who will attempt to do this, and he yes. will be hanged um, <laughs> yeah. from something yes. he built on his own property by his own house. Uh, so there's a real um, circle that we see where he actually, in many ways, fulfills this, that he, um, Darius fulfills this, when, yeah. the things that he claims for God. I love that with speed at the end. It's, like, <laughs> it's so indefinite, but like when the king of the world says, do this fast, <laughs> like, <laughs> I, think, I think things might get done. Um, mm. pretty quick <laughs> yeah well this is a good place to segue to what rachel was just talking about now the chronology of the persian empire is is somewhat confusing because we started by not taking the bible seriously and we went to the greeks and looked at how they laid things out and the names they used for the persian kings because you know they had more immediate contact in some respects because uh, they were fighting them, because you want to go to your the enemies <laughs> of the people and find out what they think of them, because that's going to be good. Right. They're going to give them all the right names and everything, too. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they're, so, they're great with names. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the Greeks do recognize uh, an Artaxerxes or two who come much later. And so the assumption is, oh, same name. So Artaxerxes, that's, that's later. And so Esther is later, and Nehemiah is later, and all that. But if we start instead with scripture, we find out that, particularly when it has to do with the letter writing, if you read the text very carefully, um, it, it, it takes some careful reading. It's, it's not necessarily obvious. On the surface, it's more confusing than anything. 
uh, but it seems the same name, this Darius is given the name Darius, and then Artaxerxes, and then Ahasuerus. And biblical scholars have debated back and forth over who's who and who these names go to and who should be included and who's out. Uh, it seems that the most obvious answer, we, we were just in the reign of Darius in chapter 6 when all of this happened. Um, and in fact, in the middle of 6, uh, verse 14, and the elders of the Jews built it, and they prophesied to the prof and they prospered to the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido, and they built it and finished according to the commandment of the God of Israel, according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And so the Greeks would say, "Well, that was several generations later. Well, the temple was long done by then. But what if we put in in place of and even, or that is to say, mm -hmm. which case derives as we've derived, discussed before? As we've discussed before, at which point derives is Artaxerxes? And when we go to the next chapter, now these now after these things, what we just read in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia." And we we can look at the the dating of the years, and it's just one year later. We've only moved a year, even though the king's name has changed. So people have said, "Well, so lots later." Just in this other, well, but we go from one year to the next year, and we've just it's, anyway. I'm going to take the position um, that that this Artaxerxes, and therefore her Azarias, and therefore the story of Esther fits just about here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we come to Esther, and as you've said, it's likely in that same um, time period. One thing to note that's of interest, just jumping back for a second, is the beginning of Ezra also gives us a list of the leaders that first went with Zerubbabel and Joshua. And among those names, mm -hmm. we do find Nehemiah and Mordecai. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're first in Nehemiah, we also see Nehemiah particularly mention that the queen is sitting there with the king that mm -hmm. he's talking to. So there seems to be a lot of this overlap of Nehemiah and Mordecai being about the same age, um, Esther being there when Nehemiah makes his plea. So that, that's maybe a little more background of how all these things are overlapping and interacting with each other. Uh, but in order to get Esther there to potentially be a support for Nehemiah when he wants to go back later, um, we find the king is celebrating and he's been doing a multi-day feast. And at the end of it, he decides he wants to um, show off his wife Vashti, who is known for being very beautiful. And in a place where the king's word is law and you don't change it, he calls her to come out and she refuses. Nowadays, we would say, oh yeah, woman power, way to go, show the man. But back then, that was treason. And <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And she was being openly rebellious, uh, which we should not praise. Mm -hmm. And so she receives actually a much lesser sentence than she should have probably, where she is just basically banished from him and divorced from him rather than being it's executed. It's interesting that we're not given any of her reasoning. Is it like, does she find this degrading or dehumanizing or is she just spiteful? We don't know. Yeah. yeah. And and you could write a whole story about who Vashti is as the great unsung, you know, feminist of the <laughs> Persian Empire. But <laughs> <laughs> the point is, she's more of the inciting moment that gets her out of the way <laughs> so that he then... Um, after he sent her away, he becomes sad and wishes that maybe he hadn't done that, um, but he can't change his decree. Because he was and like so, three days into a party at that point, right? So his judgment might not have been. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Yeah, he probably had had a lot of wine and thought, this is a great idea. And she's going, this is a stupid idea. But um, regardless, kings probably made a lot of their decisions under the influence of alcohol. In These the, are Persians, <laughs> remember. Yeah. Yes, in those days, they <laughs> loved their luxury. Uh, so eventually, as he becomes sad, his counselors come up with the idea of what we would call a beauty pageant, um, which is a nice term for what they did, which is pretty much gather up any pretty unmarried girl that they could, send her through a year of preparation of being soaked in good oils and scents and all of these things to make her absolutely as beautiful as she possibly could be to go spend one night with the king. And then unless he decided she was the one he wanted to marry, she would be sent off to the harem to live in seclusion while being well provided for, but never seeing her husband or ever having children or any such thing ever again. 
Uh, so we, in the middle of this, see a young girl who is an orphan and being raised by her uncle Mordecai. Uh, at that point, her name is Hadassah, but she's given a new name when she is taken into this program um, of Esther instead of Hadassah. And she goes through all of the process and humble. she's humble to actually do this and to not claim that it's against her religion or anything. But Mordecai does warn her not to share who her people are. Uh, and she again listens to him, uh, which we're already seeing a contrast between her and Vashti of being one that's obedient and submissive and um, goes along quietly, not... Um, not rebelling. Uh, but in the process of all this, the Lord um, causes her to find favor with the king. And so she actually is the chosen uh, bride. But in the middle of this, we see another conflict happening. So we kind of get that initial uh, relationship started. And then we jump over to Mordecai and her uncle and a man who is high up in the king's government named Haman. Um, Haman, as we no is um, a lingering Amalekite, uh, which takes us way back all the way to the exodus of the people from um, Egypt, where the Amalekites are one of the first groups to be attacking Israel and thus bring a judgment, a condemnation on them that they should be completely obliterated. Um, and so we see multiple campaigns against them at different points. This was one of the issues with Saul, where he doesn't actually um, kill all of them like he's supposed to. Uh, but as soon as we find that out, we should have an expectation of there going to be a conflict there between him and the Jews, because um, they are old enemies, old rivals. Um, as a side note, as someone who has studied um, more modern Middle Eastern history, many that are in more of the dispensationalist or Christian Zionist camp tend to pick up this story and they cast um, Iran in the role of Haman because he was a leader in the Persian Empire and thus say that today as Iran is confronting Israel. It's another uh, Haman versus Mordecai Esther story. Uh, mm. But Haman was not Persian. <laughs> the, the, yeah. We'll just put it there. Um, <laughs> and so it's not the same thing, it, pretty much. Um, there's a lot of different issues that Israel has today, but they are... They no longer have this protection that the Israelites had back then when we were waiting for Messiah. Um, and so the conflict is very different. But moving forward, uh, we find that Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman at one point. Um, again, we could speculate exactly why he chose to do that, but um, whether it's because Haman was an Amalekite or... There was something that he believed he shouldn't be bowing to him for some reason, but it incites another conflict of Haman being so, uh, what's the word? Affronted? Affronted, yes. He is I can think of a so more colloquial aff term, but that's okay. okay. Like he's so, I was like, he's downcast. Uh, <laughs> no, that this, it's, it's one of those things where one single person just, completely puts his nose out of joint and starts this whole issue um, that he looks for a way to basically destroy the Jews because Mordecai has affronted him and, and caused him to remember all of his hatred of them, mm -hmm. uh, his desire to eliminate their people. Uh, and so we get him in his famous Casting lots for how many <laughs> days does he do it? It's somewhere upward of 300. 300, 300 and, some, yeah. and something days that he basically is looking for a day when he could propose uh, to the king to have a war against the Jews. So he casts lots of yes, no, this day, 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 no. And finally, he 300 gets... 300 times God said no. <laughs> Yeah, and he didn't stop. He kept going, very persistent. Um, and so he gets his yes day, um, 300 days in the future, and uses some vague language to tell the king that there's this terrible people that are rebellious and are going to cause him lots of trouble. And so he needs to allow everybody the right to basically attack them, destroy them, take their stuff. Um, and the king 
unfortunately does not see through it because Haman is one of his chief advisors and so puts his Persian seal on this law. Um, and so it then falls to Esther as the only one that can potentially go to the king to try to plea for her people, which nobody knows are her people, including Haman. Um, but to go to the king when not summoned is considered, um, again, rebellious and um, presumptive and unless the king chooses to show favor by extending his scepter. So Esther pretty much does a lot of praying and fasting and preparing. But as um, the famous line goes, um, that if she does not, the Lord will raise up someone else to help. But perhaps she's been put in this unusual position for such a time as this. And so she, trusting in the providence of God, trusting her life to the Lord, goes, sees that golden scepter extended. The king understands something big must be going on for Esther to make, take this risk when she hadn't seen him in over a month. And so Esther goes through um, multiple rounds of extending when she's going to ask the king. So she invites him and Haman to a feast. And he says, okay, what do you want at the first feast? And she says, I want you to come to a second feast the next day. Um, and it now, is, yes. There ahead, is Greg. one thing that's, uh, that you skipped over, the, that I always skip over, that becomes really important. It's only two verses. Mm. Somewhere in here, Mordecai finds out that a couple of Chamberlain have got uh, kicked yes. off with the king mm -hmm. and are going to lay hands on him and kill him. And it, he reports to Esther, who certifies it in Mordecai's name, these two men are... Um, apprehended, interrogated, and executed. And mm -hmm. the thing is written in the Chronicles that the kings and forgotten. Nothing yes. is done. No reward for Mordecai. So that's hanging out there as a, just a weird thing <laughs> as we come back and find out. So Haman is, uh, pick up more or less, we're, uh, we'll hand it back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, coming away from the, the, the second banquet, uh, Haman is upset because Mordecai is still there and not bowing. And he needs to do something to Mordecai. Right away. Yeah. So, so he, take? yeah, his wife, again, a wonderful wife in scripture, uh, gives him <laughs> the idea of building the gallows and pretty much going to the king and getting Mordecai uh, executed. Um, but at the same time that he is therefore building these wonderfully tall gallows in his own and backyard. When we say gallows, <laughs> we should clarify that the, the cause of death is impalement, not yeah. hanging by the neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Throw him uh, on the gallows. Oh. <laughs> Um, and so at the same time in the Lord's providence, uh, the king can't sleep, which maybe we should all remember this when we have <laughs> insomnia and it feel like, why can't I sleep? Um, the Lord would have you read one, something. <laughs> I know I speak as one who has lots of insomnia. So, <laughs> um, anyway, he asks for that something to be read, uh, read the old chronicles because certainly that will put me to sleep. Uh, but in the process, he hears the old testimony that had been forgotten about what happened to Mordecai uh, or with Mordecai in how he saved the king's life. He asks, has anything been done for this man who saved my life? Uh, no. And so the next morning when he gets up and Haman comes in all ready to make his request against Mordecai, the king uh, starts with, what should I do for the man that I wish to greatly honor? And of course, Mordecai thinks, it's oh, he loves it's me. Mean, he, it's <laughs> me. I am, yes, yeah, self-centered. And so it must be about me. The king loves me the best. You mean Haman, you said Mordecai. Oh, did I? I'm sorry. Yes, oh. Mordecai comes in and no, uh, Haman comes. Haman comes in. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all can't get the names right. Uh, yes. This happens every time I've ever heard anyone tell the story of Esther. By the way, <laughs> really funny, at yeah. least once there's a Haman Mordecai mix up. Right. Haman comes in and gives this lavish description of what should happen. He assumes to himself, uh, and the king then turns it on Haman. And says, great, go do that to Mordecai, which <laughs> just makes Haman all the angrier. Uh, and therefore, he is in a great emotional and mental state when he goes to the next banquet with Esther that evening. Um, where Esther finally reveals what is going on to the king and what she, um, what she needs by saying, this is my people and they are going to be slaughtered and basically a genocide against them. And I don't know what to do because King, it was your decree that did this, but truly it was the man, Haman, that is trying to destroy us. Um, so what 
pretty much a, what should we do, king? Uh, the king leaves for a moment because he's angry. And in that moment, Haman decides to make a plea to the queen. But in the process, because they're sitting low on couches, he ends up basically falling on her legs, um, which does not look great when the king comes back in uh, mm -hmm. and accuses him, what are you going to try to do now to my queen? And so he is then immediately taken off to go to his own house and be executed on his own device. Um, but the king then honors Mordecai and Mordecai becomes his one of his chief advisors and is able to create a loophole, if you will, or um, an extra stipulation in the in the law, because they can't change the law, that basically the king approves of the Jews fighting back against this day of slaughter, which demonstrates to most people the king is actually in favor of the Jews. And if you want to be on his side, um, you should be on the Jews side, even as stories of Mordecai and such spread as well. So that the day that could have been their destruction um, becomes a day of salvation for them. And for many others who convert and and, those yeah, convert. and many others then convert um there's also a jewish festival that is commemorated called purim because mm -hmm. of the casting of lots um that to this day the jews still celebrate that and it's one of their days where they do gift giving and things like that yeah. there's a the celebratory and, yeah yes they have fun little flags that they wave around <laughs> and all sorts of things masks and such um but yes yeah. um the the reason that Esther is so important, and a lot of Christians strangely miss this, uh, is that the promise of Messiah is on the line here. We've mm -hmm. had, we've, as we've read through the Old Testament, we've seen the conflict between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman fall out again and again. And usually it's one person chasing down his godly counterpart or one nation taking on Israel. Here we have one man trying to destroy every single Jew on the planet. Mm -hmm. That's kind of big. Because Satan doesn't, I mean, Satan, if he's listening, and he is, probably can figure out tribe of Judah, but why take chances? Let's just <laughs> get them all. Let's eliminate the worship of Jehovah from the planet. Yeah, we know um, God's very sneaky, so we no, got to <laughs> Let's not own. leave God any loopholes. There might be something we missed here. Let's get, because he's getting desperate. We're, we're coming day. He, he can tell, he can read a clock and a calendar. He knows that the prophesied time is coming. Whatever he's going to do, it's going to have to be big, bad, and final. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important piece of scripture mm -hmm. uh, along those lines. Uh, and I'd like and, to point out that it's so important that this is a work of history. Um, yes. It's not a morality tale. You no. know, we, we can go back and forth about Vashti and Esther and Mordecai and mm -hmm. consider whether their actions are um, worthy of imitation in this or that respect. But the fact is, you know, there the, there's a whole lot of gray here. Yeah. Um, yeah. God does not hold up Esther, least of all, as uh, a moral example. Um, she was in this talent show. Yeah. And she won. Um, that's <laughs> not like a glowing moral yeah, recommendation especially, especially considering the talent involved right um and her her mordecai's prohibition don't tell them you're, you're a jew which means don't mm -hmm. speak about the god of israel to this man. yeah that mm -hmm. doesn't seem in line with what we would think of as an act of courageous faith no it's it's when it comes down to okay the promise is at stake and you're the one who's closest go risk your life although i've told you exactly the opposite at this mm -hmm. point okay and her humility and her faith kick in. But you're right. It's, it's, it's easy for us, both as Christians who are tempted to moralism mm -hmm. and people who've come out of recently out of the 20th century where everything yeah. has to have a psychological interpretation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have to examine the motives of all the characters. Like, we can read hearts. When did that happen? <laughs> um, if, when, in the absence of any clear commendation from God, we're often left with, what? Why? Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Uh, because the fact is, God is the one who did it. Yeah, He's the one who mm -hmm. accomplished the salvation. It was it was not due to the virtue of any singular person. And well, it, it it is significant that at this point, the things that he uses is insomnia mm -hmm. <laughs> and beauty contest, yeah. um, and the, the faith eventually of one bold young woman. Uh, it, th there's no. Flood covering the world. There, there's no rivers turning to blood and frogs swarming over the land and locusts devouring crops and the sun going black. None of that. These are the simplest 
in some ways, silliest ways. Okay, if you were going to save the world, how would you go about it? <laughs> well, first I'd make sure the king couldn't sleep. So yeah. let's let's have him eat. Let's have him eat something really hot that night, and uh, let's let's have his wife be stubborn so that he gets rid of her and gets a new one. But let's. Uh, well, maybe she shouldn't tell people who she is right away. No, 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 no. She's got to be the hero. We got to make her. She's got to come in and tell tell the king where he gets off right from the. No, it's, <laughs> she's hardly then, Wonder Woman. Yeah, and then and then she can summon power from the stars and f- star fleets. And no, it's just, <laughs> she goes in and asks. She throws a couple banquets and eventually gets her request out. This is not how Hollywood would write this story. This is how mm-hmm. most of us. This is not how most of us would write this story. Uh, but in the end, it is a major breakthrough because the gospel does start going to Gentile peoples around. A lot of the Gentiles, we're told, become Jews for fear of what's going on here. And there's no reason to not take that in the best sense possible. Um, this this is an evangel. This is one of the weirdest acts of evangelism <laughs> in the history of the world. Um, also. Uh, in Ezekiel, there is a description of a battle that more or less conforms to the constraints of what had to happen, because the enemies of the Jews did not back down. Many who might have sided against the Jews didn't and supported them, but a lot of people simply didn't care. They hated the Jews so much that they were going to risk the king's wrath on the other side and try to kill these people. And war ensued, and it would have carried certainly to Jerusalem, because that's where most of the Jews were. Um and in Ezekiel's description of this battle, and he uses a bit of figurative language. He speaks of Gog and Magog, but the nations he describes are those within the Persian Empire, not from the ends of the earth, not not people coming from the Aztec Empire and China and places. It's people they knew, but beyond the normal boundaries of what they had fought before. And they're coming into the land to a time when God's people are at peace, living in unwalled city. It's the same thing. And God intervenes and destroys the enemy, which is historically what happened. And then the re- in Ezekiel's prophecy, the restoration covenant ensues with its limited glory. Because the, the rebuilt temple that Ezekiel sees, one, well, it's a temple. Uh, when John sees the New Jerusalem, the temple is the lamb. Mm-hmm. Ezekiel sees a temple. And he sees water pouring forth one way to the Dead Sea. So this is setting us up for what's coming for a a very powerful transformation, but it's not the final one just yet. We're getting closer, we're getting closer, we're getting closer. But one thing that still has to happen is Jerusalem still really doesn't have functional walls. And after this battle, it really doesn't have functional walls. Mm -hmm. And so we're still in the same um, king's reign when his cupbearer, also a Jew, man named Nehemiah, gets word that the gates of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem are in horrible condition. This is not something that happened generations earlier. This is something that's just happened mm. because he's upset about it. It's not like, oh, well, things are still the same. I should go cry. And I was like, ah, progress was happening and it's all set back and we've lost it and everything's horrible. And he starts praying. This is Nehemiah chapter one. Um, and he not only prays immediately, he sets about with formal prayers for a few months and comes up with a plan. And it's another one of those, you're kidding, that's the plan? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to yeah, go a, to the king and be sad. That's your yeah, plan. <laughs> that That's the plan. Yeah, I'm going to go go be sad because uh, you're not supposed to be. And uh, being sad in the king's presence is kind of like being sad in God's presence. Um, Seems it's inappropriate. Not, it's inappropriate, yes. Mm-hmm. And, you, and before a human king, sinful man. Can I remember it, can, maybe, Rachel, when you were in France... Did you experience mm-hmm. this where, or were you told about saying hello twice to the same person is extremely rude because you didn't remember the first time when you encountered them, apparently? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you said bonjour already. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if I heard that one specifically, oh. but that sounds very French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Nehemiah plots it out and goes before the king and is deliberately sad the king calls him on it. Nehemiah says, and I prayed to the God of heaven. I'm sure he didn't get on his knees, raise his hands, and go through some kind of form of prayer. He did some kind of flare prayer. And says, why should I not be sad, um, your majesty, when my the city of my father's, my father's sepulchers, lies desolate waste? 
And eventually the king gets that he's trying to ask for something. Okay, what do you <laughs> want? What are you, what are you making a request? Well, I want you to send me back and rebuild the walls. And so, and the here's king, a detailed plan of what it would take. <laughs> yeah, here's the task map, the agenda, the charts, the cost analysis. He's got it. Unlike Ezra, who I sort of skipped over, um, and had gone before, uh, he's got it all dialed out. He's got it figured out. And the king there, and and the Texas, the queen sitting beside him. Well, there's only one queen we care about, as Rachel mentioned earlier, and that's Esther. So she's there, you know, kind of poke her husband. Oh, oh, that that city, that god. Yeah, we 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 we're going to do that, and so he gets permission. Well, I just mentioned Ezra, so we should go back and pick up Ezra. Ezra takes place while the whole story of Esther is being played out. He is a scribe of the law of the God of Heaven. He's a priest, and he asks for permission to go back to Jerusalem and teach God's law. And he, again, gets imperial sanction, approval from the king to go do that and to enforce it even beyond the bounds of Israel. Again, another thing that, what? What? There's a pagan king telling you you can enforce your law and people aren't even believers? What's that all about? That's called the word of God. And Ezra, rather than complaining to God about the overmuch zeal of this man, thanks God for the help he gets. And so Ezra's going back with his great plan to lead revival and teach the word of God. He no sooner gets back than he's told, yeah, all the leaders are marrying um, pagan women. You probably should fix that. And that's how the book ends. Ezra's conducting this great divorce proceedings, and he never gets in that book to do what he came to do. And so, ping, we're back. Nehemiah See, I think in. that's the only divorce that's spoken of positively. In this yeah, it's something yeah. that they, it's they married... Unusual. They married without their father's approval, and so the marriages get annulled. Mm -hmm. There is there is precedent for this. Um, because again, the promise is at stake. If all of these people marry pagans, what happens to the next generation? What will they le learn? Well, they, they're, they're not even learning to speak uh, Hebrew. So anyway, Nehemiah comes back, looks the situation over, goes and tells people, I've got royal support. We're going to rebuild the walls. Everyone's excited. And Nehemiah, and I think at this point we can fast forward a little, Nehemiah succeeds in his project, rebuilds the walls, dedicates the walls. This is new. So that this whole city now is a holy, holy city. It has become, it's gained the sanctity of the temple grounds themselves. So this is a step forward. And finally, Ezra gets to bring out the word of God and lead a great revival. He preaches and for centuries now, Protestants have taken that preaching ceremony as, or service as, uh, as sort of a precedent and background for how Protestant worship should should go forth, um, at least in part. There's a pulpit, which simply means he stood up high. Mm -hmm. There's the reading of the Word of God. There's explanation of the Word of God. Here, here's what the uh, here's what the Hebrew meant, because at this point people weren't really speaking Hebrew anymore. They were do, they were Aramaic, which is similar but not not the same. So the, in, in the original Hebrew, this means so the Presbyterian preaching, and here's the and here's the application of the thing, and uh, unlike many um, Presbyterian Reform services, there was some amening going on. <laughs> uh, but as uh, and as the people got convicted of their sins, they began to weep, which is understandable. But this is where that famous verse comes in, whereas when Nehemiah tell people, no, 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 no. This is a day of rejoicing because you've heard God's word and you understand it. You need to rejoice for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Um, and then we have the, the account of some of Nehemiah's civil reforms to try to protect the worship of God, to protect the mm -hmm. Sabbath, to protect the people again from intermarrying with pagans and all of that. Malachi is preaching about this time and adds uh, God's word from that perspective. And the Old Testament comes to an end, and the prophecies fall silent, and there are no more miracles. In fact, the last real miracle that I can remember is Daniel in the lion's den, and before that, the three Hebrew children in the fire. So we, we've reestablished godly worship. The, the books that explain that reestablishment have been written and added to the canon. God's people are spread throughout the empire. Uh, worshiping in their own little synagogues, their church-like assemblies where they read the word of God and someone preaches a sermon based on it and they pray and they chant psalms and they bear witness to their Gentile neighbors as they live in an ungodly world. Sounds familiar. 
Uh, and meanwhile, the Persian Empire goes on. Uh, and um, this Darius that we've been talking about, now if you're reading the Greek sources and the traditional Western histories, you will know Darius, but not from the Bible. You can probably read any uh, secular history, and you will see, if, it be, if it's world history or Western history, you will see Darius. There will be absolutely no mention of his connection with the Bible. What you will find out is that when he was trying to maintain his borders, depending on how this is phrased, depends. Well, it really depends on very little because the whole West is pro-Greek. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's uh, he threatened the Greek peoples in their freedom, and so they retaliated. Okay, basically, some of the Greek settlers along, or people had been there for a while, actually, along the coast of Asia Minor, decided that they were going to foment a little bit of rebellion here, and cities in the Greek mean the Greek mainland decided to back them up. For instance, Sparta and Athens. And Darius sent word and said, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you guys are in the way. This is my empire. Go away. And if you're not going to go away, well, then, you know, we're going to deal with you. And he sent ambassadors requesting samples of soil and water, which was a way of saying, I own you. I own your land. I own your water. <laughs> I own everything. And many of the Greek city-states complied, but Athens and Sparta didn't. Sparta threw the um, the ambassadors into a well and said, there's all the dirt and water you need. Um, the Athenians threw them into some kind of gorge and made the same cute comment. And so <laughs> battle begins. And that's where the Persians enter Western history in traditional sources. They ran into the Greeks, and of course the Greeks are our heroes. Mm -hmm. um, and the first battle between the Persian Empire and the Greek city states is the Battle of Marathon. And we can talk we can begin to talk more about that next time. But it is, I think it's appropriate here to again emphasize the Bible has a really high opinion of the Persian kings to this point. Mm -hmm. They've promoted the worship of God, they've rebuilt the temple, they have uh, as their advisor a Jewish queen, uh, a Jewish bu uh, butler or security guard, a Jewish um, a vizier, um, second in command, Mordecai, and they keep passing laws that are favorable to God's people, favorable to agree that if the, if the American federal government did this, everybody on both sides would be up in arms. <laughs> you shouldn't be interfering. This is how the Bible presents these people. And although at times they are intemperate, yet no more so than anybody else. Compare, Darius had some problems. Compare him to Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> I'm going to make an image and you're all going to worship it or you're going to be burnt to pieces. He doesn't do anything like that. They, The Persian Empire, by and large, when they conquered people, left them alone. They had to pay their taxes and provide soldiers. They made a few, a few concessions here and there. But they didn't try to rewrite the nature of mankind, their their view of the new world order was kindler and gentler. <laughs> um, and then you get to the Greeks, and we rewrite the ideals of the Enlightenment back into Greek history mm -hmm. and say, well, since being rational, since the Enlightenment, means this to us, surely the Greeks, from whom we think we learned this, would have been exactly like us, rational, common sense, even tempered, champions of liberty, always in the right. And so when they encountered the Persians, well, the Greeks said the Persians were given to luxury and to uh, effeminacy and to uh, worldliness. Yeah, the Greeks obviously are right. The Persians were just uh, or, or oriental despotism. They're descended from Japheth. That's not the Orient. Um, <laughs> and so we, we rewrite the histories forward in terms of our complete misunderstanding of the Greeks. And we look at every victory of the Greeks over the Persians as one more step in Western liberty, and then forget things like the battle against Sisera, or this battle here against Gog and Magog, uh, which were far more key to Western liberty because they're far more key to the survival of the promise. Well, from here, next time we can finish up our contact with the um, of the Greeks with the Persians. And then we need to probably, and we can go as far as Alexander. Then we need to back up and we need to look at the Greeks because everybody else does. So <laughs> we need to take some time with them and their philosophy. That's like it or not, yes, they are a decided influence in Western mm -hmm. history. Yeah, huge. All right, we'll do that next time. 
Uh, shall we wrap up with some rapid fire recommendations? Sure. All right. One of you. I'll first. do crime. I'll I'll do. Right. I'll go first for once. <laughs> crime and punishment. Oh boy. I rec <laughs> I recommend this largely because my kids are reading it in school, and it's been a while since I've read it. And if I'm going to ask them intelligent questions, I need to keep my memory fresh. So I started rereading it, and it was it was okay. But now I'm at the point of. You know, we basically have to read 20 pages a night. And last night, I, I zipped through the 20 and said, what, I'm done? <laughs> I want to know what happens next. I want to know the next part of the story. I kind of know what happens next. But this is so well written. It's so fast paced. It, it just takes a while. You have to get into it. And you get to the point where you like all the characters, except one of them's a murderer. <laughs> ah, what are you supposed to do with that? Oh, and the other one's a prostitute. What are you supposed to do with that? Uh, but it's But these other people seem nice enough. And... Um, this is a great story, and things keep coming out of nowhere, and it's a ghost story, and it's a uh, uh, anyway. This is another what? instance of uh, an important story that is decidedly not a morality tale. It is not a morality <laughs> tale. It is Very not much. at least no. So <laughs> have fun if you want to. If you want a good place to start in Russian literature, I think this would be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll recommend Dracula Daily. Um, mm. We were talking a little bit about this before we started recording. Um, but Dracula Daily is a Substack that you can subscribe to. Um, so every day in the story Dracula, the book by Bram Stoker, um, you know, it's it's sort of an epistolary journal format. And so it's like, you know, May 19th, here I am doing this thing. Um, and I'm still stuck in Castle Dracula. And these guys are really freaking me out. Um, and <laughs> so the the proprietor i don't know the the author he didn't write the book but he, whoever's managing the substack just sends you that day's happenings in the novel dracula so by the time we get to you know november um you've read the whole story in these little bite-sized chunks that show up in your email and i love the book dracula it's slow so probably in your email inbox a few minutes a day is probably the best way to read it mm -hmm. um but it's it's delightful. It's it's scary. There's adventures. There's good versus evil. There's a wonderful love story. It's it's really great. Okay. All right. I'm going to go a totally different direction, <laughs> and I am going to recommend uh, when you need uh, some products for your home to actually look up how to make them for yourself. Hey, I have yes. been. I <laughs> I know Emily kind of started this a few years ago, and I've done it more recently. Um, with making my own laundry soap. Um, when I got pregnant, I went, oh, I don't really want to use regular cleaners. Can I make a cleaner? Oh yeah, I just need water and vinegar and a little dish soap. Um, <laughs> recently we had spider issues. How can we get rid of spiders? Oh, Mint. just some water and essential oil. <laughs> and I've been <laughs> amazed at how simple a lot of them can be. Most of it tends to be water. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I encourage you to start thinking about ways that you can Make some of those for yourself because they tend to be a lot better um, for your home and much cheaper. So yeah. that's been one of my recent revelations. Yeah, I love that because part of what makes the stuff on the store shelves so expensive and complicated chemically is that it has to be shelf stable. They yeah. want it mm. to be available for a long time. But like if you're going through stuff, you don't need it to last forever, which means you can do kind of the less stable version with baking soda right. and vinegar. And and mm -hmm. I'm, I've never been like an essential oils person. Um, but finding out that like, oh, the reason you use lavender and everything is because it's a natural uh, antibacterial mm -hmm. or like, um, what's the other one? Tea tree oil is a natural disinfectant. It's like, mm -hmm. what? <laughs> yes. Life changing. Wow. Why did no one ever tell me this? Right. Yes. It's like, I thought it had to be bleach, you know, yeah. which just smells nasty. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good reco. <laughs> All right. Thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. A uh, big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us, dear listener, you can send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. That is the best way to get a hold of us, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, if you would like to receive our transcripts in your email inbox, perhaps along with Dracula Daily, you can subscribe to our Substack, <laughs> which is called Halting Towards Ion. I don't know how you find a Substack. I think you just search it. I've always been like linked to them by other people. I think you probably Google it. That's the answer <laughs> to most things in life. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. Hope to see you next time. <laughs>